Um, so yeah, let me introduce as well the theme that you're currently a part of, which is the theme of power play. So the way in which the theme was defined is based on your own practices. So you're put in a theme based on your practices. Um, and the theme of power play, play talks about the diminishing borders between reality and made up truths due to conspiracy theories, deep fakes and propaganda results and an urgent need for the exposure of invisible power structures. A recent occurrence in the Dutch House of Representatives could be seen as a symptom of these uncertain times. Members spoke to what turned out to be a deep fake of Leonid Volkov, the head of staff of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Quick developments in technology asked for a quick response from governments. In the Netherlands, for example, the University of Amsterdam will work in collaboration with the Netherlands Forensic Institute to further research the use of deep fakes in criminal practices. The suspicion about the vote count of 2020 presidential elections in the US um, also led to fake news circulating on social media, and this highlighted the issue once again. Finding objectivity in the current post-truth era can be a great difficulty. Hidden parts of history influence the power structure in place. The involvement of Dutch people as oppressors within the practices of slavery, for example, is a history that is inseparable from our present day society. However, our position towards it is still in progress as the recent discussion on making an official apology for the Dutch colonial past indicates. So what this means basically is that power play highlights artists, you, that uncover the challenges and realities of historical conflicts, enduring imperialist and patriarchal structures and political and economic power relations. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Kata Geibel and in the past two years I've been part of the Master Program Photography and Society at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. My, oh, it's not going, sorry. My graduation project consists of two works, a written book entitled Sea Daylight and a visual photo series by the name There is Nothing New Under the Sun. They tackle the same issues, one with words and the other with visuals. And I would like to start with the artist book. Many artists after the breakout of the pandemic found themselves robbed of their identity. Who am I if I can't take images? During the lockdown, we were forced to leave the rat race and reflect on our work. This is, of course, quite challenging for an artist, as we are entrepreneurs without any safety net whatsoever. If we stop working, our livelihood is in danger. Watching the several attempts to get exposure during a pandemic, still producing, putting our anxiety and fear aside, this is when it hit me. Our economy and society is not designed to shut down. The ideology of our time is individual responsibility. We abandoned collectivism and placed the emphasis on the empowerment on the individual and the progress is the key of success. In a society where material abundance is presented as the key to fulfillment, where we are meant to believe that with hard work, we can get to the top, no matter where we start from. An entire generation called the millennials, which I'm also part of, grew up with these promises. After I sketch out the zeitgeist of our time in the book, I take a deeper look into the business of art and how this ideology affected artists and also institutions. Artists adapting to these conditions of market logic and trends under the immense pressure of creating new work, which quickly become commodities made for consumption with a short expiration date. The artist book challenges these discourses. Instead of offering a business plan for individuals out there eager to fulfill, to fulfill themselves, it questions these market forces. I sincerely hope if on a small scale things can change, for instance, in the art world, also bigger steps are gonna follow. Uh, this, this book is meant to be a conversation and not a one-way critique of the art market and the pitfalls of our society, but instead, hopefully, a start of a critical and honest conversation. And uh, now let's dive into the visual part of my graduation project. Uh, the starting point for the project lies in my anxiety and frustration with the contemporary condition. 
a mistrust of narratives that are privileged Western free world societies lie down for us. Under our economy, we are the main beneficiaries and establishers of capitalism. We neglect and ignore those we exploit in order to maintain the system, albeit see daylight when it comes to our prestige. The hegemony of capitalism was taken closely with a new ideology, the importance of individual responsibility. We, we became achievement-oriented individuals, exploiting ourselves willingly without the need for external coercion. We became alienated from our communities without realizing that the growth-oriented attitude is not sustainable in the long run. Through symbols, allegories, image pairs, a poetic approach emerges to entangle these issues. My aim with the series is not to lecture or to lay down a strict story, nor to interpret economic issues, but to take the viewer on a journey where there are no clear answers, but instead ambiguous questions which you have to ask sooner or later, as we are not only heirs of the system, but also suffer under it. And uh, the last slide uh, will be, uh, yeah, the graduation show at Kabika, where you can see that the two projects meet in one space. The thesis is printed on seal screen posters and the images are mounted behind them on plywood. And uh, thank you for your attention and sorry that I was so nervous. And uh, thank you. I am uh, Sonia Felisa, I'm 26 years old. I would like to start this presentation with an introduction of my interests, and then I will dive deeper into uh, my work and project. During the presentation, I uh, will show you the visuals of my graduation project on my feet. I'm mostly interested in uh, what consuming knowledge does to identity, the influence of registered information on imaging. We have a lot of uh, agreed upon codes that refer to something. We use signs that take the form uh, of words and pictures to communicate. What I found fascinating about this is that they have the ability to function through interpretation and recognition. For example, faces, food, flowers, animals, but also shapes and colors. I'm uh, specifically interested in interpretations and recognitions that are based on visual culture. In uh, both uh, indoor and outdoor areas, visual transfers take place through different knowledge systems posters, newspapers, books, single images, traffic regulation signs, the internet, knowledge systems of visual transmission uh, consisting of a certain of certain compositions, colors, shapes, letters, numbering and placement. During uh, the process, I often ask the following questions. What influence do uh, the knowledge systems of visual transmission have on the development of our imagery? How are these systems of visual transmission constructed? How are we conditioned to process this information? And how does our influence imaging reflect um, on the formation of norms and values? What I do in my work is that I play with form, placement, and repetition by copying and inserting visual metaphors, creating my own symbols from photographic media to reconstruct my influence imagery. With this, I also try to represent, dissect, and question different other systems of visual transfer. Yeah, my graduation project did and not this, started by collecting several parts. For example, I started to collect photographic material, both, uh, both self-created and archive. For example, um, one, for one of the first images, I used Maria Montessori's money billet. And Moini only shows people with a certain status. From here, I uh, continue to associate and respond. So I eventually started uh, making my own symbols for the project that stood as visual metaphors for my influence imagery regarding to forming value judgments. Every day, we observe new information. Our brain connects this information to a certain standard on one level, and from an early age, we learn. Uh, new information to the various uh, number systems of visual transfer. For example, I was in a school system where uh, 
posters and pictures communicated uh, knowledge to us within a certain structure. They did that through their composition, numbering, letters, and symbols. The A stands for apple, the B for bread. As a response to the Montessori Money Boyette, I started to uh, collect elements that were used in my school system to transfer knowledge. Uh, I use this as a basis, as a grid to build up my collages. So in Dit and Dottis, I play with my own norms through um, the knowledge system's official transfer that I came in touch with. And by converting the photographic source material to symbols of my own, I systematically try to reconstruct my influence imaging through collage techniques to look into the distinctions and the nuances between right and wrong while forming a Jadawi judgment. Yeah, I would like to develop to expand this project uh, in the future to dive deeper uh, into more uh, knowledge systems official transfer. Uh, I would love to work on multiple chapters to eventually put them together in a book and for this it would be really nice to collaborate. Thank you for listening and feel free to get in touch with me. So for the sake of the timing, I'm planning to show the bits of the video of the film while I was uh, reading about my project. And then I want to show one, one and a half minute uh, video with sound. According to my calculations, I can do that just in time. So I will start quickly. Hello everyone, it's Patuan Keskinar. I literally got graduated today from the Royal Academy of Art, Masters, Photography and Society. In my artistic practice, I'm investigating power structures while primarily focusing on relations between the state and, indi in, and individuals. With its particularly turbulent political history, growing up in Turkey and being exposed to the actions of the repressive government, moved me further investigate the forms of authority and ideology. My main interest are the visual communication strategies of propaganda and the construction of narratives around nationalism, militarism and heroic myths. Throughout my master's education, I had a chance to focus on the political history of my country from a slightly distant perspective. That enabled me to dive deep into the topics that I would like to investigate, such as rising militarist and nationalist discourse, and the role of uh, the propaganda media. After a military coup attempt in 2016, Turkey's ruling party steered the media narrative in an extreme nationalist and populist direction. In addition to its notorious history of military coups, never ending oppression and violations of the fundamental rights of minorities, Turkey is being exposed to the political Islamist rhetoric of the current government. Combined with the partisan media support, the dominant narrative is spreading via news outlets, propaganda, documentaries, and TV series. There's an increasing amount of TV shows about the Ottoman Empire era, reminding the glorious past stories to strengthen this nationalist discourse while denigrating the values of the modern day democracy in Turkey. These shows often distort the historical facts and rewrite history to justify the current political ground. Thus, the line between fiction and reality is getting blurry. In this paranoid climate, it is very likely to see the effects of the polarization in the streets, in public discussions, even in children's games, almost every degree of daily life. The populist nationalist ideology permeates the culture and manifests itself in numerous and unexpected places. In this fictional political universe of populism, the crowds are warmongering, yearning to implement the death penalty and blaming external evil forces for every issue in the country. This populist discourse awaits taking responsibility, glorifying death, labeling every different voice as terrorist and seeing the opposition as pro-Western infidels. My Turkey is an experimental documentary film depicting the current political landscape of Turkey via the tools of populist nationalist media. The title My Turkey comes from a very well-known propaganda song ordered by commanders from the Turkish armed forces after the 1980 coup. This event marked the most infamous military intervention in Turkish history. The song was played endlessly on loop in prisons as a form of a torture. 
My Turkey is a two channel video installation sequenced out of found footages from historical documentaries, mainstream television, and YouTube. The film plays in continuous loop with fragmented video pieces simultaneously playing in, in two screens side by side. In the film, I'm testing the possibilities of remixing to create an alternative narrative with the material given by, by those in pa power. Thanks for listening and watching. Yeah, I also graduated um, today as Batu and Kata uh, from the program Photography and Society um, for Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. And I will share my screen as well. Um, you see my screen, I guess, right? Um, exactly. Um, I, this work is an ongoing collaboration between Jason Waters, a former Islamic extremist, and myself as an image producer. Through a dialogical way of working, we delve into the intricacies of Islamic terrorism, visual and communicative strategies, as well as its presence in mass media. Waters and I investigate the case of Mohammed Mbazi, known as Jihadi John, a notorious British terrorist named after John Lennon. Mbazi was part of a four-person terrorist cell distinguished by the members' strong British accents, which eventually became famous as the Beatles. The practice of nicknaming terrorists event, uh, seen in Mbazi's case is a common editorial strategy among media outlets. While increasing readership numbers, this approach envelops terrorists in a mythical persona, which in turn aids the terrorist mission of perpetrating fear. It others and it simplifies. Jihadi John rose to fame in 2014 and 2015 due to the beheadings footage released online by the so-called Islamic State. The vivid headlines appearing all over Western media following this period gradually established Jihadi John as an anonymous symbol, rendering the person behind the mask exchangeable. It is assumed that the man who executed the beheadings was indeed Mbazi. However, forensic doubt that he was responsible for all of the killings. With the recordings often only showing the before and after of the execution, the actual act of beheading becomes a blank space. Threat is about this blank space, undoing the mythical construct surrounding the image of Jihadi John by consciously engaging with Mwazi's life story, photographically revisiting the places where he grew up and formed his ideological views. Additionally, he, it revisits the places related to his victims, one of whom was Alan Henning, an English humanitarian aid worker in Syria. In showing that extremism often comes from within, the project leans on the idea of homegrown terrorism, taking us to the heart of London in order to understand a threat that supposedly comes from the other. The constant presence of green screens stands for the blanks in the story, reflecting on the projective nature of nicknames, as well as photographic images themselves. Rather than providing information, the mass media approach to Islamic terrorism, reporting often leaves a blank by giving the terrorist publicity. 
a key point in the process of untangling this type of media imagery and nicknames was an editing session with Jason Waters, which took place in a large green screen studio, a strange place in itself, where we talked about the images I have taken about the inconspicuous nature, as well as their associative value. The session was fully documented in the form of transcripts and snapshots of the resulting ins installation. Using the method of a crazy wall, reminiscent of a police criminal investigations, we arranged the photograph on a wall, highlighting the connections between various layers of the work. The discussion that happened over these images, just as many before, was instrumental for this work in many ways. Firstly, because we avoided discussing his biography as a former extremist in detail, but rather focus on the perspective on the bigger picture of Islamic extremism and radical ideologies. Secondly, we found an interesting connection in the fact that Jason spent some years imprisoned in Fücht, a former concentration camp in the Netherlands, and I grew up in close proximity of one myself in Dachau. Finally, our conversation was sparked by related experiences of Jason, as someone who had recently left an extremist movement and my extensive dealing with former neo-Nazis over the last couple of years. In bringing this work to life, I was a photographer whenever I took photographs, an interviewer and listener whenever we had our discussions, mediator when we tried to make sense out of it, and an editor when we edited the images on a crazy wall. My aim was not to create an iconic work, but rather to establish an ongoing dialogue and the process of rapprochement between a former extremist and a photographer. I like to understand this dialogue as a way of countering extremism, shifting from a threat as a danger to a threat as a discourse. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jan Romanova. Uh, I also graduated from uh, today from Master of Photography and Society as a uh, several of my dear uh, classmates here and I want to present um, my project uh, with a little bit help of uh, my friend Asia. So Asia, uh, please chin up. Chin up. Uh, can Jana. You... Yeah. Can you move uh, closer to the camera? Um, like, yeah. Yes. Yes. Very, very good. Can you can you put your chin down? Yes. And can you perform a silent scream? One moment. Very good. That's it. That's it. That was very good. Great. Can you put your video of your project chin up and chin down? Chin up. Raise your left arm. Can you look more wild? Raise your left arm. Worship me. Can you ask me to take my clothes off? No. But help me. Don't be sexy. So uh, that was a, a short trailer and a short demonstration. Thank you, Asha, for a project that I've been working on um, uh, during my um, studies at uh, Photography and Society. So it's a performative game uh, that reflects upon the relationships between the photographer, the one being photographed and the camera. The people give each other multiple instructions on you know, where to move, uh, what to do, and even what to feel and how to feel. And their communication is based on controlling each other in front of the camera and for the camera. And this idea comes from this regular photographic act uh, of how a photographer controls uh, the model's behavior. Uh, but in this case, 
both people who are playing this game have equal agency. And uh, for me, what was very interesting in this project is to look into their, uh, this power dynamics and how the power is distributed and exchanged and uh, also the differences between uh, what is being said and uh, what is being done. And this project exists in the form of a video documentation and also in the form of uh, a booklet. I will show you just in a second. So this is how uh, the book looks like. So after each game, and the game lasts only for 15 minutes, uh, anyone can play it. Um, I make a booklet. Uh, which is a translation of this game into a photography format. So it kind of um, brings back uh, photography uh, into um, um, into the conversation. So in this book, um, um, there are screenshots uh, made from the video and also the transcription of different instructions that were given. And uh, these instructions um, first you read what was the instruction and then you see how it was performed. And um, also you can read uh, if something was answered and if there was any text uh, related into it. Um, this project is also related to my uh, thesis and it came out of my thesis where I write about images that I can't show. And I discuss the relationship between the language and photography and uh, the notion of misunderstanding. And uh, yeah, it's basically both of these uh, works, both the thesis and the Chin Up, Chin Down project are uh, very much related to my uh, practice. Uh, I've been active as a uh, photographer and artist for quite some time. And uh, I've been mainly interested in this relationship between, yeah, between the language and uh, photography and uh, this whole notion of understanding. Um, yeah, so currently I'm looking for different collaborations um, with institutions and I would love to do this project um, and is in many places as possible uh, to collect the information about how we control each other and how do we perform power on a daily basis and how the power relationships also manifest themselves in photography as a medium. Thank you so much. And these are some of my contacts and uh, my website where you can find more information about this project. Thank you so much. My name is Kester. Uh, on screen, you can see a quick selection um, of a few series I made uh, over the years. But um, uh, just to give an introduction to myself, uh, I'm a photography, uh, photography student at the Nederlandse Academie for Beeldcreatie in Amsterdam. Uh, as a photographer, I'm uh, interested in capturing uh, the persona or image of my surroundings. Uh, in this, I try to capture the various signs and symbols, uh, indications uh, in which the viewer can experience the environment for themselves. Uh, it gives the viewer the space to discover the hidden story uh, behind each photograph. Uh, that's why um, I only photograph using a tripod uh, so I can determine exactly what will and what will not be displayed uh, in frame. Um, in this way, I have total control over the outcome of the image. So, uh, my project is about uh, Tata Steel, uh, and it's called Persoonlijke Hoogovens, Het Gezicht van Tata Steel, or in English, um, Personal um, um, Blast Furnaces, The Face of Tata Steel. Uh, for those of you who don't know about uh, for those of you who don't know, Tata Steel is an Indian steel production company uh, based in the Netherlands. Um, it hasn't always been an Indian company. Uh, the origin of the steel company was an initiative uh, of the Dutch government in the early 20s to make the Netherlands less dependent uh, from steel import uh, from other countries. So um, over the years, Tata Steel has gained a lot of neg negative media attention. Uh, most of these uh, reports are about the high environmental impact of the factories and the consequence, uh, consequences the factories have on the environment and the health of the local citizens. Uh, because of the mainly negative uh, image sketched by the media, I think that uh, most of the Dutch uh, population has a negative image of Tata Steel itself. Uh, so when they think of Tata Steel, they think of um, 
images spread uh, by the media, uh, image like the enormous polluting factories or uh, red hot blowing steel that it's uh, producing. Uh, but nobody knows what is truly going on on the inside. Uh, so the personal connection with the company is almost uh, non-existent. However, uh, Tata Steel is so much more than uh, just a steel company. It's one of the biggest employees, uh, employers of the Netherlands, providing over 9,000 people a stable job. Uh, some of them have worked for the company um, for more than three generations long. Uh, over the years, the terrain has uh, grown a lot uh, and it has almost become a, a small city. Um, they have their own fire department, their own small hospital, and their own academy to educate their students for a career inside the company. Uh, all subjects which were never highlighted or uh, mentioned in the media before. Uh, in my photographic series, I wanted to create a personal connection with the company by photographing the places. Uh, unknown to the Dutch public and the Dutch media, uh, the places where the workers of the factory um, and the office spend their time. So uh, the places that make Tata so special. Um, the environment where people work and live in tells so much about a, a person instead of portrait, in my opinion. Um, for example, uh, when I'm paying a visit to my grandmother, I can immediately, uh, immediately tell that she is partly Indonesian uh, because her living room is filled with uh, wooden Indonesian sculptures. Or when I'm visiting, visiting the office of my father, I immediately uh, know he likes to entrepreneur because uh, his bookshelf is filled with books about entrepreneurship. So by looking around in a photograph uh, of the environment where people spend their time, you as the viewer learn uh, more and more about the people uh, who spend uh, their time in these environments. Uh, elements and symbols and images uh, will create and display a certain personality to you. Uh, my photographic series is not meant, uh, meant to be a statement, but it's more about creating awareness, uh, awareness for the other side of the story, awareness for a company uh, that has been part of the Dutch history for over a century. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was my presentation. So, um, for further information, uh, you can contact me uh, about my other projects uh, or visit my website. Uh, thank you for listening. My name is Emil, indeed. I'm a photographer that just recently graduated from the Photo Academy. Um, and my work is focused on investigating the tension between what we see or what we think we see and what we know or what we think we know. And most of the time I base myself on, on let's say, scientific ideas or cultural frames. Um, and in this presentation, I would like to share my graduation project, which is called Laws of the Haystack. It's an, it's an investigation into the, the fickle role photography, photographic images can play with our mind in creating and framing reality. But it starts with a personal story. During a holiday, I took a snapshot of a haystack, just an ordinary haystack, except that it made me think of other structures and other images. And as I returned to the place where this haystack was standing to take a better picture, it was gone. However, long after my holiday, I still felt the need to discover what this one image contained, but did not reveal. During that time, I became fascinated with 19th century Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. He claims that the only objects in our world are not the cups or the tables or the cameras we see, but the atoms that continuously move around into changing micro configurations. But of course, as we cannot see atoms, we are not aware of these parallel realities. Inspired by uh, Mr. Boltzmann, I investigate what this one image of the haystack hides. So what I do is I deconstruct and assemble one original photo by hand many times, looking to discover alternative shapes and meanings, hopefully shapes I have not fully seen before. And sometimes I just pause and you can have a look. 
in the spirit of Boltzmann, I've applied a pseudo-scientific approach uh, with strict and sometimes absurd laws. The two most important laws are that one, it must be clear that all images are staged, but they should be photographed in a transparent manner. And secondly, the, the configurations are not to be created, but to be discovered, to be stumbled upon by play, by hand. And during this project, I felt like Darwin must have felt when he saw the abundance of life on the Galapagos Islands. I stumble upon 15 generic types of structures, some of which I'll show you here, and within those many, many variants. In fact, there are so many possibilities that I'm convinced that I've not discovered the most interesting types yet. And as an example, if you just cut up any photo into 10 columns, there are more than, like in this case, and you just shift columns, there are more than 4 million possibilities. And so the chance that you'll find back your original image is almost zero. So you could say that in a way, we only see a very, very small amount of what you could call reality. And next to the overwhelming amount of possibilities, I discover that most shapes that I probably subconsciously create refer back to some kind of ancient mystical sublime forms, Stonehenge, obelisk, etc. And I wonder, is this a collective memory or is this a result of my cultural imprint, of my youth memories, maybe? And by photographing these temporary configurations in a transparent manner, I also investigate the question if a photograph that could be half real but is clearly staged, is it reality? When is something reality? What is the truth value of a photograph or even of our own perception? I've summarized the project in a, in a book with a selection, a small selection of the, about 250 recordings that I've organized as a scientific report with its own language, its own mathematics, etc. Of course, I'm not finished with this because there are endless possibilities. So I probably will go on as one of the other projects that I will keep doing, um, looking for, uh, for what we can't see, but maybe know. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, hello everyone. Um, okay, so I'm graduating from Gerrit Ritzfeld Academy uh, in photography department, but um, sorry, I forgot to put my timer on. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm graduating with a film which called uh, The Revolution. Uh, I'm originally from Belarus and uh, as some of you know, maybe one year ago there was um, elections, uh, highly rigid elections. And since then I was, I mean, I was in Amsterdam and I was trying to, to find a way how to tell the story, you know, revolution happening in my country and I want people to know what's happening. And I tried to attract um, media attention and through making some uh, events trying to reach them and um so one second one second tasha yeah, um uh, emil can you maybe unshare your screen yes sorry that's okay no it's okay i don't even know how to do that hold on new share no pause share you can stop share in the on the red button okay sorry sorry about this no, sorry. that's okay sorry, sorry. Sorry. Okay, so I will try to share my screen um, because I want to show you um, a small um, piece of my film, The Revolution. So as I told, so this year actually I worked a lot more like as an activist and uh, I made a few exhibitions dedicated to protest art in Belarus and but the whole situation was like being in Amsterdam and trying to talk about Belarus was a bit like here, like trying to break this wall of uh, kind of not being heard, or it, it's felt a bit like screaming through, through the glass door or like something very important is happening in my country. And I cannot convey people here that it's super important and they all have to know it. 
So I think my film turned to be actually exactly uh, about this feeling. And I want to just show you a sh small intro. Uh, so you got the feeling of the film because it's very slow. It's, I mean, it's 12 minutes film, but I want to show you just a couple of minutes. So you got a bit the mood. And, um, so let me know if the sound is okay. Hi, Donald. How are you? Would you be available for a short call some days this week? I would really want your advice. I still haven't got your reply. Are you still angry with me? Please give me a call. I really need to talk. Great to know that you're on vacation. August is a time just like that. I can imagine. You know, I sent some emails to different media, but no one really replied to me. It seems the world doesn't care about the situation. I wrote to the correspondent and they really liked my keynote, but they said they are on vacation and can reply in six or eight weeks. Eight weeks. I mean, revolution may happen in a couple of weeks. The whole world can change in eight weeks. I'm doubting to go or not, but I think it would be really nice to be there. I have big hopes, but also big fear what, what might happen. I think this film gives me a bit of confidence that I should go. You know, not just to hang out around, but go with a purpose. And it could be my second film and I could be like a real director. I know no one really assigned it to me. I just can go and make it. To my friends, Jenny and Yula, they can host me at their place. As you mentioned, I better focus not on the street, but turn the camera around. So yeah, I thought about making this film about talks in the kitchen. Um, it can be probably more intimate. Anyway, I would be afraid to film outside. The police can get really brutal. Yeah, so this is a, was just a small um, expert from the film. Um, so basically it's a yeah, 12 minutes uh, short film. And I would like, um, it, you're sort of, yeah, it's half documentary, so half fiction uh, film uh, about going to the revolution and joining the revolution and trying to convey somebody who is maybe listening or maybe not. And um, I try to translate my experience of kind of living this double life of being in Amsterdam and closely following situation in Belarus and knowing that sort of the world doesn't care so much, but still very enthusiastic and trying to convey the world that you know, you should know what's happening in Belarus right now. Um, so yeah, and I would like to uh, have opportunity to show this film and share it with people. And everybody, of course, is welcome to a Ritual Radiation show. I'm showing it there. But I would be happy um, to screen it somewhere because, I mean, production was quite long. <laughs> That's my time. Production took a lot of time and it was super difficult. And now suddenly, I have the whole film, but then I have to, I want people to see it. I want to, you know, feel what I felt because it was very, it is very important. Situation in Belarus is still very harsh, but at least I don't want to have this distance between, uh, I'm talking about Belarus. No, I'm in Amsterdam, I'm here, and I'm talking what happened in being in Amsterdam and uh, kind of trying to speak the same language. But because before when I work with this team, people try to be distant because they don't know about, Belarus and any other country, but I think through this film I want to be sort of on the same level and try and yeah make people understand. And this is my uh, contact details. You can know a bit more. Thank you. It's uh, an honor to uh, have the final presentation of uh, of the day. I um, I graduated uh, from the photo academy uh, last uh, last month, and um, I'll uh, try to share my screen to uh, show you my. Uh, 
graduation. I think you can see my screen. Yes, yep. we can. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, and the contrary to uh, most participants uh, today, uh, I didn't graduate with one project, but I have uh, uh, multiple projects. I'd like to show you uh, a few of them uh, in my presentation. Uh, I design uh, editorial images uh, about uh, social uh, current uh, current social teams. And uh, my images uh, put the, those developments in, in perspective and at the same time uh, also review them critically. Uh, in my work, most of the times products are brought to life by giving them human characteristics. Uh, to reinforce it, to give it added value, I also like to animate uh, my, my stills and uh, also combine it through uh, augmented reality. If I have time left in my five minutes, I'd like to show you uh, one or two examples. And uh, to abstract uh, my, uh, my subjects, uh, I'm using uh, color as, uh, as an instrument uh, more often. Uh, the, the first series uh, I'm going to show you is about uh, genetically modified foods. And the question I ask uh, myself and many people do is, uh, is, it, uh, is it a curse or a blessing, the, uh, the gen genetically modified crops? Uh, by modification of the, the DNA, it's possible to resist the, the crop against, uh, for instance, uh, insect damage and, uh, and viral infections. But uh, on the other hand, uh, GM foods may carry within themselves uh, unpredictable toxins. And uh, due to a full monopoly on the seeds, uh, the price of the seeds uh, has uh, really soared to, uh, to astonishing, uh, astonishing heights. Now, my second series is about uh, food colors. Uh, an astonishing amount of the, of the food we eat is processed. These foods are altered to make them appealing. You could think of it like a cosmetics for, uh, for your food. Uh, most synthetic food dyes are derived from petroleum, petroleum or crude oil. And research has associated that food dyes, uh, amongst others, uh, cause serious allergic reactions, irritability, and also aggressiveness. Uh, the third uh, series I'd like to show you is about uh, the protection of our cultural heritages. A uh, question more often is asked, is the Netherlands still a tolerant and colorful country? We strongly value dem democracy, human rights, and freedom of speech. But what if other cultures are trying to join in and our cultural heritages and traditions are compromised? Uh, this is about uh, the pharma industry. Uh, it was uh, made even before the first uh, corona vaccine uh, was on the market. Uh, but uh, yeah, we see that uh, the pharmaceutical sector endangers positive outcomes more often. Whether it's bribing a doctor for prospective medicines, respectively, or health need government employees facilitating the infiltration of substandard medicines into the distribution system. More often, public resources are wasted and patients' health are at risk. This is a short animation. <laughs> Another one, burnout. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, burnout isn't just as synonymous with being stressed out. It's a syndrome conceptualized as a result from chronic workplace stress. This has not been successfully managed. This is a series when I was uh, much younger, my goal was to uh, be a sports photographer. And that those series is already a bit older, but was to turn around for me that uh, sports, sports photography was not really uh, what I was aiming for. And uh, this is more or less the start of uh, the photographer that I'm uh, right now. The last series I'd like to show you is about uh, the dignified end of life. Uh, one of the greatest fear of elderly people half about dying is losing their senses of dignity, communication and independence. Self-respect, mutual respect, and respect for privacy are not key aspects, are key aspects, sorry, in the dignity and of life care. I'd like to show you what I asked you, what I told you. Um, wait. Yep. 
Yeah. I think you see my screen again? Yes, we do. Okay, yes. good. Uh, so this is the screen of my phone and the augmented reality and new technology is really uh, giving me uh, a lot of new creative opportunities because I was always looking for a possibility to more combine my stills with my animations because my still was really on paper and magazines and in animations uh, are usually, you know, of course, digitally and on, uh, on the web. So here you see the image uh, from my presentation about food coloring. And there's a small, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a small code uh, included in, uh, in, uh, in the print. Once uh, your phone or the camera of your phone recognizes uh, the code and you uh, point uh, to the image, then uh, your image uh, starts getting a light Hi. more or less starts getting- Did you know that an astonishing amount of the foods we eat are processed? These foods are appealing. If food coloring is cosmetics for your food. Most synthetic food dyes are derived from petroleum or crude oil. Research has associated food dyes with irritability and allergic reactions. Yep. That's it.